Hey, Zerm listeners, Love is Blind, the reunion, season five. Let's see what happens and then see what comes flying out of my face. It's not fun, I'll tell you that. It was, uh, it was hard going through it and uh, it was even harder to watch. What was hard for you, JP? Uh, just knowing that I probably should have done more and I'm, I didn't know like, that I was gonna be like so nervous when like cameras are like right on your face. Yeah, I, I suspected that might have been part of it and that in the pods it might have been easier for him because the cameras aren't in his face. They are hidden. He knows they're there, but he doesn't feel them. <laughs> the The people, the human beings are, are there, right? And also the pods are so, uh, you know, you know you're being filmed all the time. And so you th figure most of what is being filmed isn't going to be used on the show. Whereas when they're having one of those conversations with like him and Taylor, he's probably thinking, well, I see everyone. And also I'm pretty sure this is going to end up on the show. So yeah, I, 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 I suspect that he was in fact, very nervous. Probably the cameras didn't help, but I also think that Taylor, his relationship with Taylor, because the cameras aren't there all the time. So if they could have, when the cameras were gone, had good interactions, I'm guessing one that would have helped Taylor, but also it would have helped him to feel more comfortable. So presumably even when the cameras weren't there, he was also very nervous, which lends itself to the hypothesis that it wasn't just the cameras, it was actually just the reality of having to deal with the intensity of the situation, either being engaged to someone or, I don't know, something about it. Because he was nervous in front of Taylor, not just in front of the cameras, it seemed. Because like, when you're in the lounge and stuff, they're like, kind of off to the side, so you don't really see them. When you get to Mexico, there's two cameras in the room, and there's a bunch of people. And I mean, at the very least, he is not blaming Taylor, which he could do, which is what he did on camera. He was blaming her, while at the same time sneaking in these, I think, more fundamental statements like, well, you're going to leave me anyway, or, oh, I screwed that one up. So, I, yeah, you just feel bad for him. He was still quite something. Uh, it doesn't... You know, when we are nervous, we are going to act strange. Our brain is focusing its attention oxygen-wise to other circuits that don't involve our higher mind thinking. Our prefrontal cortex is getting less oxygen and less ability, less focus for the neuronal attention, if you will, such that we are more in a fight or flight. We're more in a survivor mode. Uh, we can't think straight. We don't process things as well. We can't plan for the future. We can't reflect on our on our emotions as well. We're more reactive to the situation, which makes sense. When a tiger is chasing us on the African savanna 200,000 years ago or today, we should not be thinking about math or tomorrow. We should be thinking about running and getting away. And you don't need to be processing uh, things on a higher level. So... You just need to have the perception, have the emotion. Blood goes to the centers of the brain and to the body that propels you away from the tiger. So we are all like that, but all of us have different ways of coping with that and reacting to that. For some people, they shut down. For some people, they shut down. And then when they're pressured, they become mean. Because at any point, he could have said, particularly off camera to her, I am so sorry, I am terrified. I'm so nervous. I didn't think I'd be this nervous. He could have said that. Uh, and maybe he did, but it didn't look like he did, right? So I, I think he knows this. I don't think that this is like a Stacy situation or an Uche situation. I think that he knows, oof, it, you know, and hearing him talk about why. I, it's so satisfying to hear him say this because I'm glad for him because this means that he has the ability to change and to know this about himself. But so often on this show, I am thinking that's what everyone should be saying. That's what Uche should be saying. That's what Stacy should be saying. A lot of people should be saying that. And some do. Johnny said, mm, that was pretty petty. Uh, she could have said more along those lines. But for him, you really feel it. Like he's, he's just like, oh, boy, that, that, that's mortifying. I'm just watching. Like, what's wrong with me? I was so nervous, and he might have been so nervous he didn't know he was nervous, if that makes any sense, especially if he's prone to nerves. In fact, 
when they were showing us a recap, I didn't note this at the time because I didn't know what to look for, but I think he might have a lot of trauma in his life. And he does, of course, because he did talk about it, right, with his mom being abusive to his sisters, right? So he might have either PTSD or something akin to that. And who knows? I'm not diagnosing him, but it wouldn't be unusual for someone going through that, that they have a very quick nervous adrenaline reaction when under stress or threat of any kind. When he proposed to Taylor in the pods, he, he, you could really hear it in his voice. <laughs> Taylor, and, and it's cute, right? Because he's nervous, because he's, because he's proposing. He, he understands the importance of the situation. I mean, when I proposed to my wife, I, I had a similar, like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Uh, I think a lot of people are in that situation. But his seemed particularly physical and visceral, and I don't know, but he might have a very quick reaction to threat that he had to learn when he was young to save himself from situations. And for people that have those kind of conditions, once they're in a p place of threat, I mean, not only the cameras, but Taylor, and it's not threat threat, right? But our body perceives it as threat threatening, right? It's not like an actual tiger, but we are, we evolved clearly as social creatures to, uh, you know, one way of looking at it as is that previous mammals or previous organisms that we evolved from, so to speak, is they evolved mechanisms to assess threat and to have emotion and have motivation for behavior that saved them from physical threats like a, like a predator. And then as we evolved as primates and other mammals to become more social, we didn't invent new emotions and new motivations. We just co-opted as an organism because, of course, that's what you do. You, you don't just invent an emotion out of thin air. You have to slowly ad adapt something. And so uh, apparently, seemingly, who knows, we co-opted that system of physical threat to apply to social threat because if we consider it threatening to be rejected or to be humiliated or to be i don't know socially judged or something if we interpret that as a threat and we have fear and we run from that humiliation by trying to correct for the humiliation that also locks it into our brain so that we know the next time we are in that situation, we have to prepare, we have to act differently. In the same way that if a tiger is, you know, the way that PTSD works and, and memory and trauma is that you hear a little uh, a, a, a branch that snaps and you hear maybe a little footstep. And you don't think of it at the time because you're you've never been attacked by a tiger. And then you hear the rustling of leaves and then you're not really registering it, but you kind of look over it, and all of a sudden there's a tiger. Okay. And then you're running away. Well, the brain, the way that we adapted, a lot of organisms are like this, is we, we pull in all of the data, not just the tiger with the fangs and the color, but we also take in the time of day or the smells that might be completely unrelated to the attack. But we also are encoding that footstep and the breaking of the branch such that the next day or the next year, we hear a little snap and we evolve this mechanism to instantly fly into threat because it could, could be a tiger again. Well, the same thing is co-opted by our social threat system to keep us within the tribe. We need, we need harmony and getting along and cooperation. And if we don't have the tribe to protect us, we will die in all likelihood. So we evolved to have this instinct to bond and to avoid disharmony. And so when we are having all these cameras and I'm unsure about Taylor and I'm not in my home, I'm in a strange place, it might be hard to, you know, he doesn't have his cell phone, he doesn't have his passport, you know, because they take those things away. There's a lot of threat there that could be felt as the same as a tiger because we co-opted that and it's threatening. And so you're in this constant state. And so for people that have that go through a lot of trauma, 
they uh, have a very robust reactive system. You know, people who go through a lot of trauma, they tend to react with hypervigilance or with more fear or, and their fear team you know, tends to be more intense. And it's because those neurons that were more frequently fired when they were younger, they become more easily fired in the future. That's how our brain works is that if you repeat a process over and over and over again, whether it's fear or riding a bike, the brains, the, the strength of those connections become stronger and thus the next time it wants to fire, it's more quick to fire is a simple way of putting it. What wires together, fires together. It has to do with brain plasticity and all this kind of thing. That you know, The reason why I can speak English right now and move my arms like this is because I've done it so many times that I don't have to think much about it to do it. Whereas if you asked me to ride a unicycle or something, I don't have those neurons that have been you know, practiced and fired together. But if I did that enough times, I'd be able to ride a, ride a unicycle. Anyway, so when someone has been through trauma after trauma, meaning that there's terror after terror after terror after terror, then you have this very quick reactive system in your brain that results in the adrenaline and the prefrontal cortex shutting down. And, and then it's possible, you know, thread of the cameras, does Taylor like me? She's so pretty, I don't know. I'm, I'm being awkward, I'm, I'm screwing this up. No one's gonna love me. And you know, uh, maybe even some projection of some sort about his mom or his sister or something of disapproval, um, authority. Because you know, you got to take into account the producers are a part of his life at that time. Uh, I'm in a strange country. What's happening? I'm in a constant state of anxiety and fear and nervousness, and I'm just holding on. And 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 I don't know what's happening. And then, oh wait, what? What? I'm being awkward. Well, just just leave me alone. You know, you can imagine that being the case, right? If you are in a state of difficulty, pain, or you know, you break your leg and you're in utter pain and someone comes up to you and says, um, yeah, so what do you want to have for dinner tonight? And you'd be like, what? Uh, you wouldn't even be able to hear the question. And they're like, hey, you know, they're really get. what do you want for dinner? You'd, you'd, you'd snap at them. You'd be like, what? get the fuck away from me, <laughs> even if they're your spouse or something. Um, I, it's possible that that's what was happening for him, right? It seems very likely, given what he's saying here. And it doesn't excuse the dickishness, though, like I said. there, That's what, so he needs to obviously heal, not need, but he would benefit by healing from the trauma if he does indeed have this. And uh, he, in the interim, would benefit by having other ways of coping with the nervousness, other ways of dealing with it while he is in treatment. You know, after 10 years of trauma treatment, presumably the trauma reactivity would be mostly mitigated. In the interim, he needs some routine. Maybe even he writes down a few lines on a piece of card when he's nervous. It's like, okay, don't be a dick. Okay, say, say this following sentence. I'm sorry, I'm very nervous right now and I'm having a reaction. I'm in therapy. Give me a second, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So uh, this is, I, I'm, I'm encouraged definitely by a lot of things that he said post Taylor. You're just like, what are we supposed to do? Are you it saying you just, feel like you, you couldn't be yourself? You would have acted differently had the cameras not been so Yeah, present? I just feel Don't like you? I was thrown back into my shell and I just, I didn't know what to do. I was just. Yeah, I imagine Taylor is gonna say, yeah, but the cameras weren't always there, pal. <laughs> we slept in the same bed. The cameras weren't there. So what about that? Nervous and freaking out. What about when the cameras weren't there? I mean, it was still weird because, like, what are we supposed to do? We're just supposed to sit here? We kind of. Yeah. I, I, I still think that my hypothesis is in the ballpark. I mean, he certainly doesn't come across like a person who is very comfortable, right? And usually what that points to is terror, is nervousness. Situations that for us, might be fine, or we might be a little nervous. For some people, they might, might be so nervous that their brain just cannot even function. We have the pod conversations as a contrast. He was never, apparently, a dick, and in the edit, he certainly wasn't. And he was, um, he, he was reserved, but he was very communicative, one of the most open people on the show in a lot of ways. So 
he, uh, you know, I he cried, right, if I remember right, openly. So he, it sounds like he's at the beginning, at the very least he can identify that it's not her fault. It's his fault for being nervous. I guess he's blaming the cameras, but he, I don't know, at least he's saying he got nervous. He's not saying, well, the cameras are in my face. I didn't know what to do. You know, fuck you. He's saying, I was nervous because of the cameras. I think he's, you know, he's at the beginning of potentially his uh, self-awareness campaign. Talked, communicated. Yeah, but it was long days and you didn't want to be there anyway, so. I didn't want to be there. Right, so I don't know, maybe he has data along these lines, but I think in addition to all these things, he has this schema of no one wants to be with me. And uh, who knows about his childhood experiences specifically, but there's a possibility that his dad wasn't around and maybe rejected him or you know chronically rejected him we didn't hear anything about his dad i have a feeling his dad wasn't around i didn't hear anything about that but that rejection could lead to a child concluding that they don't deserve any love also observing abuse and you know he he frames it as he would observe abuse by his mom but he also mentioned that his mom was was pretty mean so he he was abused and also witnessing abuse is abusive to particularly to a child because it's terrifying it, it's the thing to think about with terror or the thing to think about with trauma is how scared was the individual right like you could go to a scary movie some of you might even be able to test this my wife can certainly that if you go to a horror movie it's it's not there's no actual threat right it's not actually you're not actually in danger but if you have a terror reaction, then that can lead to certain trauma effects down the line. So for him, at the very least, he observed it and he probably felt terror for his family. Also, just that that the terror of being you know, home is supposed to be where it's safe, right? And if home is the place of the monster, the mom, and also not only home is supposed to be safe, but mom is supposed to be safe. But if the home base is also the monster, then you have nowhere to go. And as a child, you're just completely untethered. It's just a chronic state of terror. You go to sleep in terror. You wake up afraid. You go through the day afraid. Every moment is just drenched in this constant fear that you're feeling, and it just becomes part of your environment. But when, and this is what leads to addiction for a lot of people is they get prescribed an opiate, they take an opiate, and it actually numbs their a lot of things, including their emotions, such that for the very first time in their life, they don't feel that fear. And they're just like, oh, I want more of this. And then addiction happens. Either. Yeah, you try to leave you every single not day. You not be there. Yeah, because you, you didn't want to be there. You wouldn't communicate with me. You wouldn't talk to me. Okay. You didn't try. You just admitted you didn't try. That was very clear. Watching back, that was very clear. You did not try. Yeah, uh, she is entitled to grill him about this because the way he's explaining it, he's saying, well, the cameras made me nervous. And then Stacy asked, and Taylor was happy, what about all the times when the cameras weren't there? And he's like, well, it was just, I was nervous. And it, oh, well, the, the, then he launched in with, because you didn't want to be with me. So he's still blaming her, unfortunately. It's not your makeup was caked on. <laughs> it was that you didn't want to be with me. Yeah. And I don't know. And who knows? Maybe she didn't. Maybe there was something about the way he looked when she first saw him or something. But it didn't look that way to me anyway. At the very least, if there was a chance, he tanked it by his behavior. So I don't know. I, I feel bad for him. I, I've been saying this from the beginning. JP is being unfair to Taylor. But I don't know. Many people are going to believe JP. So I don't think Taylor's going to be left out in the cold with no support. Also, moving on in the future, I don't have many worries about Taylor. I have a lot of worries about JP. So many worries for him. Because... Not only do we have what we see, which is someone that is very much struggling, but also with whatever else is going on with his trauma that is still affecting him, emotions, depression, self-esteem, reactivity, PTSD, uh, lots of things, right? Self-image, own, his own schemas of uh, I'm not worth it, right? Oh, yeah. So that's what I was talking So when you're being abused and you're going through all this terror, there's this notion that children will naturally, almost all the time, it's almost universal, that children, when they're experiencing something horrible, and you know, when, when we look at it, we're like, well, the kid is innocent. 
the child will absolutely blame themselves. They will think it's my fault that this is happening. Some of you still have remnants, strong or small remnants of this way of thinking. It almost is impossible to get rid of it completely because it gets locked in in the brain early. That even though intellectually you know that you didn't deserve it and it wasn't your fault, children will still blame themselves. They they see the world as being an extension of themselves. They have an undifferentiated sense of their own power in the world and what encompasses the world. And when good things are happening, it's because of them. And when bad things are happening, it's because of them. And when a lot of bad things are happening, they they just come to this natural conclusion. It must be because there's something about me as to why this is happening. I'm causing it or I'm adopted or I'm literally an alien. Some kids will think that they're from outer space and that's why they're been that's why they're being treated poorly or they're not good enough. They don't do chores well enough. They're not smart enough. They're not cute enough. There's these conclusions that are just tragic. It's one thing for a kid to go through trauma. It's another thing for them to conclude there's something inherently wrong with them such that they deserve it. And it's very possible that he is of that sort, that he went through the trauma and he said, it's because of me. No one will want to be with me. Uh, it's just, inha- I'm inherently rejectable. I'm inherently uh, you know, rejectable in the sense of, My mom isn't there for me emotionally, or she doesn't care enough about me to not abuse us. And so it's just, it just is what it is. And then he meets Taylor and maybe in dating relationships, it's a little, uh, there's fewer stakes, lower stakes. So he's able to kind of function. But when it comes to being engaged, he's just like, there's no way. I mean, (laughs) she's going to reject me. And I don't know, but I could also imagine him thinking that she's, pretty and probably has a lot of options in terms of other people. And he's just like, yep, just absolutely. She hates me. There's no possible way that she's going to want to be with me. So, you know, he's nervous. He's convinced of that. He's in his head. He shuts down. She starts saying, hey, you're awkward. And he's just like, just get away. I I think that's what was happening. But I don't think he, he doesn't seem to be that aware of it. He's aware of it enough. He's aware of it enough and differentiated and mature enough to admit the nervousness, which is a very good sign, but he's still got a lot of work to do, it seems. Are you buying his explanation that it had to do with the cameras, or you think it was something much deeper than that? A lot deeper than that. Sure, I was nervous too with the cameras on. I think she's going to say that he didn't really like her. I think that uh, given everything that we've heard and seen, I think that that's a very low likelihood. But it's also very natural for people to think since he's not being nice to me, he must not be attracted to me. That's that that has to be the only reason. And I, it's possible, but I don't think that's it. I'm sure we all were, but that's not an excuse. I had a ring on my finger. We were supposed to get married in three weeks, and you're gonna let the cameras ruin that, or my makeup, or whatever else it was. Yeah. Not okay. And it was hard watching back. A lot of tears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't think about that. That because you'd hope that Taylor watching it would be like, "Oh, wow! I, I, I thought I was in the right, but watching it, I was clearly in the right." <laughs> in fact, I could have gone off on him more, and I didn't. So that's I feel proud of myself. But it's also painful because she's being attacked and she's losing someone that she loved. You know, she fell in love intensely in those ten days in the pods with someone that had a big heart and a a lot of warmth and compatibility. Uh, The kindergarten teacher and the fireman. I don't know, it just seems to match. and So uh, it'd be painful. What was hard for you, Taylor? Because I felt like I did try. I was basically pulling things out of him in Mexico and it was still not enough. That's not the way to get me to open up is to keep hounding me yeah, another thing about is we're hearing that the off-camera behavior was the same, which we didn't know. I suspected that, but I assume if away from the cameras things were much different or even slightly different, we would have heard something. And uh, uh, so I think that's what we're hearing. But you know, he's bringing this back to the hounding on it, and I suspect that 
given the trauma that he went through and maybe other experiences, he's not actually his age in this in this realm. I'm guessing he's fine at his job and paying the bills. He's an adult in that way. But when it comes to emotional and relationship matters, if I didn't, if I couldn't hear his, the tone of his voice and I couldn't see him, I would assume that he's like 13 because, or I don't know, maybe 17, but younger than 18, because that's the way kids will talk. Not all of them, of course, but many kids will say things like this of, just leave me alone, you know. It, and then, it, when you're, if you've ever had a kid in your family or your own child or um, a student in your class, and you're trying to reach out to them, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you leave them alone, they won't reach out to you. And if you try to reach out to them and try to help them, they get upset because you're trying to talk to them. And and because of their traumas or their nervousness, it's like there's just no avenue to help them. And you're actually trying to help them in a way. You know, you're not trying to. You're not a police officer that's going to throw them in prison. You're you're actually there to assist them. You're you're not forcing them to do anything. And so you'll you'll be frustrated with that. If you've had that experience, you know what that is, and that that's what's happening right now. It's like, so what am I supposed to do, JP? Avoid you and have no interactions with you, or I or should I try to interact with you? <laughs> Which is I didn't. And Taylor did not hound him. Taylor was doing everything, and I, I thought she was very skilled, and also revealed her you know her demeanor as a kindergarten teacher that you would have to have a lot of patience and a lot of putting yourself aside and a lot of being able to just be a calm presence. You know that she was doing that for a long time. It wasn't until you know f- day four that she and and really it wasn't until he started insulting her and being mean to her that she finally was like actually drawing boundaries so it's unfair for him to say this it's it's disappointing he started out really good but this is disappointing he's basically saying a very similar thing that he did before and i'm guessing he's just as nervous right now there's nothing different about the scenario you've got the cameras you have taylor he's probably terrified saying hey this is awkward this is awkward do better it's not the way to the conversation was the same every single time i was trying to like figure out what the problem was well, apparently it was my makeup that threw him for a loop. But you said you didn't believe that it was just that, that it was more. What do you think that it was? I don't think that he was attracted to me from the second. Right. So it's possible, but he, I mean, maybe, and the incel potential is still there that could be kind of in this category of, oh, I thought she was a granola, but she's not. She's a makeup lady. And he, uh, it's possible, but consistently he, kept falling back to this baseline foundation of, well, you were going to leave me anyway. And you just don't say that if you're put off by someone, you know, I mean, maybe it's some grand scheme to, to draw people off the scent, but I I think, I don't think it's that he wasn't attracted to her. It's possible that he never even began to ask the question as to whether or not he was attracted to her because he knew she wouldn't be attracted to him. So uh, you know, it's possible that he wasn't exhibiting attraction because he figured, why, why do that? And we met each other. Um, he gave me zero validation. When I asked about our future, as we saw, he didn't answer. Um, and yeah, I mean, in the clip, you know, she was like, so do you think you could sleep with me the rest of your life? And he's like, I don't know. And again, I think he is terrified and he's answering that question from a place of well i'm sure you don't want to sleep with me the rest of my life so why am i answering this question on top of that you belittled me and made me feel less than i am i'm sorry for that and i did not intend for that to come out that way and it came out wrong and i do feel bad for that so i apologize okay yeah that's good he's not doubling down yeah it's just, I really hope he gets the help that everyone deserves. Everyone deserves therapy. He particularly deserves it. And I really hope, and I worry that he's in an echo chamber that won't allow for that, where he's been socialized gender-wise to not allow for that. But he, he has so much potential if he were to... I don't know, but if he were to get what I, so if my hypothesis is near the mark somewhat, if he went through five, 10 years of therapy, like he he would blossom. I 
genuinely wanted to just let you know that I thought you looked beautiful without makeup. And that's the only thing I was trying to say. And it came out wrong and I'm sorry. And yeah. I forgive you. Thank you. We're human. We make mistakes, but learn from it. Don't do that to another girl. Yeah, and that's my worry is that he'll just say, I'm never gonna do that again. I, I've learned my lesson, I'm not gonna do it again, which is what so many people do in life and on these shows. They, they just say, I'm just not gonna do that again without wondering what is it about my personality and my relational traumas that led to that? Because if, even if I don't do that again, I'll do something else that will cause the same problem. Um, for you, Taylor, you mentioned when you first saw him, you were also very transparent. You're like, look, he's got a gap in his teeth. I wouldn't normally go for that, but I fell in love with this guy. So do you think that as you got to Mexico, his physical started to kind of wear on you or that had nothing to do with it? Nothing to do with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't look that way, but I bet you for her, similar to him, but for a different reason, she never had a chance to really think about her attraction to him because he was such a different person in person. But I think she would claim, and I'd probably be accurate, that if he were even just a little bit more communicative, that a, a physical attraction would have been definitely present. Law, but that's why I came on the show, was to fall in love with somebody emotionally. And that's what I did, but it just wasn't enough. Well, JP, I think, I don't want to speak for you, but I think you said that what you were trying to say was, I think you're beautiful without makeup. Yeah, it's just and, and you, came out and wrong. You maybe said it in a way that was not, not the smoothest. I guess that's not the way it looked to me. <laughs> I mean, I, I get that the host is letting him off the hook a little bit, and I, I worry that a lot of men would see that. And I feel like I saw comments along those lines of men or people identifying with him and saying, hey, and defending him. And, and you know, it, there's nothing wrong with having one's point of view. And I certainly don't have a monopoly on knowledge and objectivity, but that's not anything close to what was happening. It, it's certainly if he believed, it seemed that he believed that she was pretty without her makeup. Okay. That's one of, you know, that was like 1% of what was being communicated and what was being said by him. Uh, maybe he messed it up. It's possible that he just completely flubbed the communication, but it doesn't seem likely. I think he actually had hostile intentions. I think he wanted to put her down. And I think he was nervous. I think he was terrified. It's also possible that, and I think I might have said this at the time, that given his level of self-awareness, which is is kind of there, but I think he's far from being aware of what he needs to be aware of, that when he saw her in person, there were a lot of things happening for him. One of a, a very small aspect of what was happening for him was that he did not like how much makeup she had on. Okay. But there was this whole other aspect of his experience that was dominating his experience of the nervousness and she's not going to like me and uh, I don't feel safe and I'm terrified and I'm having a trauma reaction right now. That's all out of his awareness. But he is aware of this sentence in his head of just like, I don't like that makeup. And so later on, he's trying to figure out what happened and he's thinking, well, the only thing consciously I'm aware of is that I, I didn't like her makeup. So that must be why I was being awkward without understanding the vast sea of emotion he was going through in the moment. Taylor? Definitely the first time I saw her it was a little shocking and off-putting, but... Why is that? I just think it's kind of fake and not something that I generally like to, I don't know. Wow, so he says shocking and off-putting. So now I'm wondering if he, I mean, like I said, you can have a preference, it's fine. But to, <laughs> this is such a weird way of looking at the world. You know, even if, even if she came out in something really atrocious in terms of makeup or something, just really just like, oh my God, it wouldn't be hard as a human being to say, well, it, uh, we can have a conversation about that down the line. Maybe I'll get used to it. There's a human being behind that. I don't know what's going on there. You would know that the essence of the human is not any different. It's just there's a thing on the outside or something, you know. And I want to. I, I did go back and watch that scene 
to my cultural pocket eyes, meaning I'm in a cultural pocket of some sort, she had minimal makeup on. <laughs> now, TV tends to lessen makeup from what I understand, to actually look like you have makeup on TV, you have to wear a lot of makeup. And so when you're in person, you're like, well, it's a lot of makeup, but it doesn't show up on TV, I think. So maybe, but anyway, even if it was that, it was. So now I'm thinking, is this some indoctrination of some sort of some echo chamber, some brainwashing happening where this fake idea, it's still there? It's disappointing that a year and a half later, he's still... He's still thinking this stuff? I don't know. It's hard to know. It's the only hypothesis I have is that he, he's in some sort of echo chamber, possibly incel related. I don't know. But there could be others. Um, maybe he has trauma around makeup. That's a possibility someone had makeup on in his family or maybe his mom might have. Maybe, I don't know, just <laughs> total guess. His mom would wear makeup when she would go out. She would come home with a guy. I don't know. And he associates makeup. You know, it's possible. But something weird is going on with him. Something very limiting to him. Obviously, it's hurtful to Taylor. But Taylor will find other people that have that don't even have anywhere near this problem. Like, she's not going to run into this again, in all likelihood. He will continually run into this because he is this. And there's something going on there. And I, it's unfortunate that it's harming Taylor. But it's more unfortunate for him long term. Speaking of the makeup again is what we're talking about. Yeah. Is she someone that you would go hit on in a bar? Uh, generally, I don't. And any women, I have my friends. I don't know if the hosts are really picking up on how potentially traumatized and how nervous he is and was. He's currently nervous, I, I suspect. So for them to ask these questions, it's. I, I think it's really just orbiting around the problem plus like to ask him like would you hit on women in a bar that requires him not to be terrified <laughs> so i think he's answering that question like i wouldn't do that yeah how you feeling taylor <laughs> mm. i'm okay <laughs> um but like you said i guess things could have been handled differently if you would have told me hey stop hounding me about the same thing, I, mean, I probably would have. I mean, he kind of did, but then you would have nothing. And I did think this at the time. I think I might have said it that if they just had a different context, it might have worked out differently and maybe had worked out for the better. He still needs to work on some things, but if the cameras weren't around or they were just dating normally where he could have dinner with her and then go home and hang out with her and then go home for a couple of days, you know, he could warm up to it and feel more safe as time goes on. But given just how concentrated and how intense it is and how he doesn't have a home base, you know, if you have anxiety, I've had anxiety in my life. It's been kind of a roller coaster ride throughout my adult life, but for me, a very important thing, and it is for a lot of people, this is why agoraphobia develops, is because we often, as anxious people, and just people in general, when we don't feel safe, we want our home base, we want something we can depend on, and when we're home, there's far fewer variables that can threaten us, right? We can control our environment, we have predictability, we we know how things are going to work. Um, as an example, from my own life, many years ago, I was moving into a place, a new home for the first time, and I had just moved everything in, and I was going to sleep on the floor uh, for the first night, and I was all by myself. And I remember just being terrified as I went to bed because I had this feeling that, I mean, I wasn't terrified, but I remember noting just how unsafe I felt. But in my, so my conscious mind is like, but I own or rent this place. This is my place. But it doesn't feel like my place because it wasn't my place earlier today, but it is now. And I'm by myself and I don't know the neighbors. And I, I just kept feeling like there was threat around. And I'm like, but there isn't really. And I'm guessing tomorrow I'll feel fine. So it's just first time sleeping in a, it just feels like a foreign, it's like having an arm that's not yours. It's like what's happening? And I, uh, it's like that, right? Where you want to, you know, home isn't just your home. It's where you feel comfortable and most comfortable, right? 
And I, I wonder if JP could have regulated easier if he had a home base that he could go back to his own place and wouldn't have been as, as you know triggered as much that he could have actually opened up similar to the pods. But it was such an onslaught of nervousness and feeling overwhelmed and criticized and it's it's pointless anyway because you're never going to love me. It, it just he just shut down, shut down, shut down. And JP, do you find that you're able to communicate with your current girlfriend? Yes. I learned a lot from it. I'm sure he did too. And that's what you do with failed relationships. You learn from it and you take it into your next relationship and you do things differently. I hope someone asks him, "Does your new partner wear makeup?" <laughs> because I'm guessing that. She might, I don't know. In the end, congrats again, guys. Congratulations. Here's to finding love and celebrating love. Take care, everyone. Bye. Yay! All right, well, interesting season. I think it is always good that this show gives us a chance to reflect on our own lives and the people around us. And it's also entertaining, gives us something to get up in arms about. It's got it all. It feels less climactic since the show didn't have more couples and there were so many problems that kind of throw... It's sort of like when you're watching a football game and the ref is calling odd calls, you know, foul this or, you know, pass interference. And it's like, come on, let him play. It just feels like there could have been a game there, but there was interference from the outside. And it feels like with the whole shenanigans that were happening it feels like uh, something it, it could have been great kind of a thing but people screwed with the thing you know people coming on the show who actually know each other and then other kinds of things happening it just feels like there's some disappointment there that wasn't present in other seasons seemingly because you know we don't know I you know I've gone kind of on a roller coaster with the season. At first, I was into it, and then as time was kind of going on, I was like, ah, oh, this feels like there's not much to get into. But then there was. So I think in the end, it was an interesting season. Definitely wouldn't put it up there now that we have five Love Is Blind seasons as one of my favorites. I would say one and four were pretty great. I, I you know I, I have a hard time differentiating between two and three sometimes. <laughs> I feel like I should make a list. I probably should. Anyway, so and until next time when there's another Love is Blind, because we have season six and seven that have already been filmed and or it seems like maybe they'll always do two seasons a year, maybe. Uh, it seems like Ultimatum is also kind of locked in. So if you are interested in watching it with me, join me on this channel. Until then, everyone, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.